So I want to introduce our speaker today. His name is Mark Gordon Fee. He's the president and founder of First Love Ministry. He is an engaging speaker and teacher known for his warm personality, fun and passionate teaching style, and gifted ability to make scripture come alive. A dynamic worship leader and songwriter, Mark has also been playing the piano, singing, and writing for most of his life. He received a BA and bachelor's education from Wheaton College, a master's of divinity degree from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and a doctorate of ministry degree from Talbert School of Theology. Prior to launching First Love Ministries, Mark was the lead pastor of Binion Metro North Church for 17 years, where God forged these materials in and through that beloved community. In 2006, God called him out of pastoraling locally to be his first love messenger to the whole church, a role he cherishes and enjoys immensely. Let's welcome our speaker today. Okay. <clears throat> What's that? Yep, it's on. It's on. I never grow comfortable hearing somebody read that. <laughs> I'm just ordinary. Um, but it does help you get a little idea about uh, who I am. So, Father, we just pray right now. Um, we've enjoyed being together so far and loving and being loved by you through the music. And, uh, but we pray now, Father, that you would also touch our hearts through your word through the things that you have me say today. Most of all, that we'd be transformed just a little bit more into the likeness of Jesus for the sake of those all around us, inside and outside the church, Lord. We need you to continue to change us, transform us. So we just offer this remainder of our time together. Be blessed and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, how, how far can I move? Because I know you're like filming or whatever. Stay in the light. Stay in the light. Stay in the light. Is this still in the light? Still in the light. All right. <laughs> you have fun playing with that light thing, don't you? So anyway, okay. <clears throat> that first song, The Creed, I, I really, really enjoy that song. And it was nice to hear that song again today. And... Remember, at the chorus, we say, I believe in God the Father, I believe in God the Son, I believe in God the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. My sister is a PhD theologian, teaches at Northern Seminary, and uh, my father's really the only Dr. Fee that we actually know or respect. I just became Dr. Fee in December, so I don't even relate to it. It's just weird. But anyway, so my sister Cherith... One day, though, she just found herself saying this in a theology class, and it hit me listening to that song this morning. I thought I'd, do the, I'd say the same thing to you guys, and that is, who's the third person of the Trinity? There is no third person of the Trinity. The Trinity in no place at no time is numbered. If anybody's actually third, it would be Jesus. Why? Because God is at the beginning and the Spirit is at the beginning hovering over the waters and the Spirit is throughout the whole Old Testament primarily as the one who anointed kings, prophets, priests, and he was the one who would also be promised though to not just be to the few but to the many. In some ways Jesus is the third because he's the one that we discover is actually also God at his baptism, at his ascension. But the bottom line is there is no first, second, or third. There is one God who is in three persons. One God in three persons, all equal in every way and yet function differently. What's even interesting is that Paul, at the end of 2 Corinthians 13, in his final benediction, he says, now may, and he does it in this order, now may the grace of the Lord Jesus the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, that's what people experience first, 
Then they discover it's based on the, the heart and love and initiation of God the Father, but it's applied, it's experienced. The one who lives and dwells and abides in us is the fellowship, the koinonia of the Holy Spirit. Something that's very, very interesting. Now, did you all get your hand out for today? Brenda, did they, everybody get it? Okay, sweet. Oh, wow, it's shrunk down into that little piece, huh? I hope you can read it. <clears throat> In the, in the Old Testament, the, the title of the message is The New Way of Living, and you'll understand why I've, I've chosen that, but in the Old Testament, and particularly for the Jews, they had particular identity markers that marked them out as being God's chosen people. The two primary identity markers were circumcision and the law. Circumcision and the law. This is what was their thing that said, this is what makes us who we are. This is what God did when he chose us. This is how we are reminded and remember that we are his people. But there was this very, very powerful moment. It's actually not one of the verses that's there, but if you want to write it down, right there next to the word gospel, um, that's there in your notes, is Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, probably, in my opinion, among many promises that God gave, it's probably the most extraordinary, most wonderful promise, I think, that he gave to us, in addition to the promise that there would be a Savior. In Ezekiel 36, 26, God says, he promises, there will be a day when I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit New heart and a new spirit. He says, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you to move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. He promised something new. A new spirit, a new heart. And honestly, that's the, that's the heart and soul of the message of the gospel, where the verse I did give you here, Acts 2, 38, the very first time the gospel is ever preached by Peter, at the end, as the people are listening and they hear about what was done to Jesus, but then God raised Jesus from the dead and then he had sent his Holy Spirit and he says, this is what's happening among you. And all the people say, what do we do? What do we do? How do we respond to this message? To which Peter says, there it says, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's in that moment that Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27 is being proclaimed as being fulfilled. Because that's how we get a new heart, isn't it? The way we get a new heart is that by believing in what Jesus did for us, that he died for us, was raised, ascended, is at the right hand of the Father. That, in believing that and repenting, we experience this forgiveness of sins and we get new birth. We get a new heart. Romans 5.5, Paul says, And hope doesn't disappoint us because he's poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Something changes inside of us and we become a new creature, a new creation. In fact, the next verse there, Romans 8.16, to me, I know in Pentecostal tradition, um, there's been teaching along the way that the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit is tongues. And I don't happen to agree with that. I think this is actually the evidence verse, from my opinion. And that's when Paul says, The Spirit Himself, the Spirit Himself testifies or confirms with, bears witness with your spirit that you are God's child. How do you know that you know? Because something happens spirit to spirit, and you go, I'm loved. I'm forgiven. I'm His. That's how you know. I was just thinking about the gospel and, and, and thinking, um, I was in a context and thinking about somebody, well, the Christian faith and, and it's a faith and it's something that you just believe. And I said, you know what? 
That's not true ultimately. Yes, you do believe, but what you first experience when you believe is an experience. The Christian faith is first and foremost an experience. It's about getting reconciled to the living God. And God, the Holy Spirit, comes into your heart. You feel forgiven. You feel like you've been born again. You feel His presence that you know that you know that you know that you are His child. He pours His love into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. And you just know It's not a religion that you simply ascribe some sort of mental assent to or I was raised to believe these certain principles or whatever. It starts off and continues for the rest of our lives as this relationship with the living God by His Spirit. Being a Christian is the coolest thing on the planet. Woohoo! It don't get no better. Seriously. But see, every now and then I get a little bit alarmed about the gospel because sometimes, I'm afraid sometimes more often than not, the gospel gets shared without telling people that they not only get forgiveness of sins, but they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's really the new identity marker. If the old marker was circumcision and the law, The new identity marker of God's new people, which is made up of Jew and Gentile. The new identity marker is the Spirit. Think about Paul in Acts 19 when he runs into the the disciples from Ephesus. And the first question he asks them, did you receive the Spirit when you believed? In fact, John, in his gospel, in John 7, remember when Jesus stands up on the last day of the feast, and he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and streams, rivers of living water will flow from within you. And then there's this little parenthetical statement where John says, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed were later to receive. That's what it means to become a Christian. So that Paul, when he runs into these two guys in Acts 19, he says, Did you receive the Spirit when you believed? And they go, what Spirit? To which Paul says, well, what did you believe? And they said, well, we believed in John's baptism. And And Paul says, that was a baptism of repentance, which is the first part, right? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. But he says, then he told them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they believed, they laid hands on him and they were filled with the Spirit and spoke in tongues and prophesied. In Galatians 3, verse 2 and verse 5, twice he says to the people in Galatia, he says, who has bewitched you? Did you receive the Spirit by believing or by obeying the law? Did you receive the Spirit by believing or by obeying the law? This is what it means to be Christian friends. This is the gospel. The good news of the gospel is a new heart and a new spirit. So that we can actually live out this new life. I will give you my spirit. I will put him in you to move you, move you, empower you. To follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Oh, you guys. Again, that's worth singing and dancing for. Saw my brother back there, like standing there by the door, and the dude's doing just a little ooh la la, you know. I said, Boy, can dance. It's why we sing. It's why we move. It's why we dance. It's why we can't keep our mouths shut. You realize that evangelism, a pastor should never, ever, ever, ever have to preach a message on evangelism because if you're experiencing the love and power and presence of God in a profound way, you can't keep your mouth shut. How many times did Jesus say, don't go tell anybody? And how many times did anybody obey him? Never. Never. Why? Because they've encountered the power and presence of the living God, the love of the living God, the woman at the well, right? I mean, Jesus prophesies and tells her that he knows everything about her, yet she feels so loved by him, she runs back to town and says, I think I found the guy. Come meet him. 
He's the Messiah. Do you realize if we're experiencing what our faith is really about, the power and presence and love of God by the person of God, the Holy Spirit in our lives, and you're growing in that love, you're experiencing that love daily, you can't keep your mouth shut to want to invite others into that. I got a few mm mm-hmms. No, I know. I'm just saying that some of us aren't experiencing quite the, the, the degree of, of what I think the potential of what it means to, to be a Christian really is. It's a big part of what the weekend is that I'll be doing here in a month <laughs> called First Loved. Because at the heart and soul of you guys, it's learning how to actually come and be loved daily in a really concrete and tangible way so that you are so touched by that love of God that you cannot help but to want and go give it away, to imitate, to share. And the weekend is really the practical, practical ways, two primary ways about how to be loved by God, particularly as the disciples were by Jesus. How do we get loved in in an embodied human form again today, the way the disciples were? The weekend will change your life. And I'm not, I don't just say those words lightly. Almost every, almost every feedback that comes at the end of a weekend, people will say this was life-changing. Most life-changing. How many of you did it before that are here? Is that true, some of you guys, that it was really, did it touch your lives? This summer makes 30 years. 30 years since the day the Lord first revealed this to me when I was 18 years old, a Christian back then. It changed my life. That's why I felt... 13 years ago, the Lord told me to leave pastoring the local church and go out to the whole church and say, church, there's a message that Jesus left to us, that we're to love one another. I saw it out there in the lobby, which I was thrilled to see that. But John 13, 34, that we're supposed to love one another as he's loved us. And the critical thing is how do we get loved by Jesus daily so that we can turn around and love as he's loved us? I'll tell you, the weekend will change your life. Most times, it's a three-day weekend. It's Friday night through Sunday lunch, so one of the sessions you don't get to hear, but you're going to get to hear at least the two primary practices that will help you be loved in a really powerful way so that you can go out and love as loved. And you'll be so filled with joy, you can't keep your mouth shut. woo <laughs> Being a Christian, it's actually a really good thing. But here's the other thing about the promise of the Holy Spirit coming and being fulfilled. As I said, that the identity markers were <clears throat> circumcision and the law. In fact, in Acts 15, right after <clears throat> the Gentiles, in Acts 10, Peter, some of you may remember your Bible stories, that Peter, you know, that has that, that vision, and God says not everything's unclean if I declare it otherwise, and then the messengers come, they go to the Gentiles' house, which is such a cool moment because Peter doesn't even get the chance to give the altar call when all of a sudden everybody just starts crying and weeping and speaking in tongues, and they're like, oh my gosh, I guess God loves Gentiles too. But then what happens is that they start finding out that Peter and Paul and perhaps others are saying that you don't have to get circumcised. And you don't have to necessarily keep the law. And they're getting pretty bent out of shape, especially the Pharisees that have probably become believers. And they're saying, wait, what are you saying? And essentially they're saying that the identity markers of Christians are supposed to be belief in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, whereby as we spend time in the Word, The Spirit uses that to help us walk with Him in the new way of the Spirit. You guys, God was brilliant. Surprise! 
You understand that at, when Jesus died, rose, and ascended, there was no Wycliffe Bible translators. In fact, it was only till several hundred years ago with Gutenberg's press that people actually started having their own Bibles. Do you realize that the only way people were ever, ever, ever encountered the Word of God was when somebody who actually had it could talk about it and share it, and the only way they went home with it is they had to memorize it. That might not be a bad thing if all our Bibles had to disappear, because maybe you'd actually start internalizing it, and it would change us. I'm just trying to shake you up a little bit. But I am trying to dislodge your thinking just a little bit because over the years on occasion I'd hear my father, again, the real doctor fee to me, but every now and then, just to try to shake things up a little bit, he would kind of refer to the non-biblical trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Bible. The biblical trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as revealed to us through the Bible. And here's why God was, it was such genius, because when the, when the, when the love of God went out to Gentiles, non-Jews, and was going to include them all, it was going to go to all kinds of nations that there wouldn't be a Bible written in their language. But do you understand that when he put the Holy Spirit into their hearts, they would know the fruit of the Spirit would actually be the fulfillment of the law, Paul says. That was the brilliance of God. When they didn't have it, so when Paul would show up and he would teach from the Bible, yes, he would ground them with truth. He would inform them with truth. He would expand their knowledge and understanding of God. But living out the Christian life was being filled with walking, keeping in step with the Spirit of God who in fact is the, the primary one who transforms us. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says that as we all with unveiled faces behold the Lord's glory as in a mirror are being transformed into that image from one degree to another by the Lord who is the Spirit. That's what he's doing in your heart and life. Our job is to cooperate with him. So on the other side of that piece of paper you have, you'll see it says, um, what does it say at the top? From the Spirit's heart to yours. What you have there is that there is a time when I first, one of the things that, that the Lord had me learn to do was to take scriptures that talked about Him or to Him and put them first person so that God could actually say the verse himself to us. So one day I recognized that even though I grew up in a Holy Spirit tradition, I don't think I really knew him as a person. And so one day, over a number of days, I don't know how long it took me, but I went through all my favorite Holy Spirit passages and I put them in first person so that the Holy Spirit could actually talk to me about himself. That back page there is God's gift to you this morning so that you can go home and discover not the third person, but one of the persons, and it's the person of God who was actually sent to us to be with us and in us where the Father and Son make their home in us. It could be one of the best things you ever do is to spend every single day for I don't know how many days it would take and just listen to Him tell you who He is and what He wants to do in your life. And you know the remarkable thing about most of those verses is there's hardly not a single one about gifts in terms of power gifts. Do you realize that his primary identity from Jesus' own lips was that he would come and be the helper, the spirit of truth who would guide us into all truth, that he would teach us, Jesus said, John 14, 26, he would teach us and remind us of everything. John 16, 13, he says, the spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth and he will speak, not on his own, but he will speak to you what me and the Father want to also say to you. He's our helper. 
He's our friend. Jesus said, I am not abandoning you and leaving you as orphans, but the Father and I, by the Spirit, are going to come and inhabit you and make our home with you. Welcome to Christianity. It's really good. It's really amazing. Please don't hear me saying that I am not minimizing, devaluing one iota scripture. Jesus said it all matters. I'm just saying that the danger is, is that if we're not careful, we can move into an Old Testament way of living where we're trying to live out law, live out rules, live out principles, live out commands in the way those who didn't have the Spirit, where what we want to be able is to live, be led by full of the Holy Spirit as we're following Him, He's going to help us do everything that's in the book. Because Paul also said in Galatians, he said, therefore, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. But he says, use your freedom to serve one another humbly in love. Because the entire law, he says, is filled in the one command to love God or to love your neighbor as yourself. All of it. You realize the Holy Spirit empowers you to live that out to be thinking about others. You realize that all of those fruit of the Spirit, which are... Where did I stick it here in your notes? It's on the... It's what, the fifth, fifth bullet there, I think? Where did I put it? I know it's there. Oh, there it is. It's the third bullet, I believe. <clears throat> Under the new way versus the old way. Do you see it there? Galatians 5, 22 to 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, which in several of the commentaries I think are really accurate. Several of the commentaries point out the fact that love, again, is number one, love is primary, that actually results in peace and joy. You realize the fruit of having loving relationships with God and with one another the fruit, the byproduct of that is peace and joy. True peace and true joy. But you realize all the rest of them, except for self-control, are ways in which love is expressed depending on who the person is in front of you and what they need. Sometimes love looks like patience. Sometimes love looks like kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. All of that is expressions of love, see? Now, the primary verse that, that I had given for the, the sermon today is at the top of your notes there, Romans 7, 6. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Just trying to help you understand this. I didn't come up with this. This is from Paul. And here's what I want you to understand. This is the summary verse of, of an illustration he began in verse 2, where he tries to tell the people when in Rome, the Roman church, this is a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. So he says, friends, I need to help you understand that we are living in this new way of the Spirit that will in fact cause us to live out the commands and the decrees and the ways of the Lord. But what he says is this, he uses this kind of crazy illustration where he says, you know when a husband and wife are married, we'll make this the husband, we'll make this the wife. He says when the husband and the wife are married, he says if the husband dies, she is now released from that law and she's free to remarry and does not commit adultery. Basically, he says, unless the man dies in this illustration, if you try to be released from the man, but there's not a death, and then you remarry, he says, you will be in adultery. So he's using this marriage thing. If the man dies, she's free and released to remarry anyone else she wants. Now, here's what gets a little tricky. And hopefully I can, I can do this. I didn't try this with my hands, so <laughs> be gracious. I'm trying to figure this out. 
Now he's saying the law, as it were, is like the man. You and I are like the woman. And under the old way of the written code, you were bound. It was one of the identity markers. And you were bound to keep it and obey it and walk in all of it. And most of the time we couldn't do it, so you always felt full of guilt and shame. And most of the time you felt weak to to put it into practice. Remember Romans 7? Paul says, I keep doing the things I don't want to do, etc., etc., okay? So what he says now, it's weird, because he like changes it. So he says, it's like, we're kind of like the woman now, and the law's like the man. But instead of the man dying, he says, you and I died in Jesus. By dying in Jesus, we're no longer connected to the law. Oh, but then Jesus, we were raised with Christ, but now that means in Christ, we're eligible to be bound to someone else. And it's actually Jesus. That we get bound, belong to Jesus, so that we come into this relationship. But in this relationship, the question is, is how do we live it out? To which comes this sentence when he says, folks, do you understand what I'm telling you? Having died to what once bound us, We have been released from the law so that we live, serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Oh my gosh! I mean, that would have just been, whoa, mind-blowing. And others are going, wait, man, you can't be putting the law down like that. You understand how radical to the ears of a Jew that would have been. But the point is, it's not diminishing the law. It's saying that it's the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, the rebirth and renewal and His presence in us who moves us to follow, moves us to keep, transforms us in our minds and our hearts so that we're always thinking about what does love look like in this moment and if you are loving, you'll fulfill the law. Yay! Yay! So look at the second bullet. Galatians 5, it should be just 16. But we are going to pick up 17, 16, 17, and 18. But just so you see it again, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. So we've been released from the law. To live in the new way, he says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. Now that third bullet where we see the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, um, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But then comes this remarkable line. Against such things, there is no law. You know what that means? It means as you're going about being kind, as you're going about being patient, as you're going about being loving, there's not the voice of, of condemnation behind you saying, stop that patience. You're breaking the law. And he says, you'll never hear that. As you move about in your life and you're loving like Jesus, loving in the power of the Spirit, fulfilling everything that's in the book, you're never going to hear, shame on you. Stop that. Freedom! Oh, I'm convinced that this is such a big part of Jesus' New York yoke when he says, come and learn from me because I am gentle and humble of heart and you will find rest for your soul. Because what I'm describing to you is if we will remain in, walk in the Spirit of God, it's easy and light. Rest for our souls. What time am I supposed to be done? Y'all good? And again, please do not hear me as saying that I'm against the Bible. I love the Bible. Jesus loved the Bible. But we're not trying to live in our own strength to measure up to its principles and rules and laws and whatever else. 
We have been released from that pressure to live in the new way of the Spirit. And he says, if you are led by the Spirit, you're no longer under law. If you will bear the fruit of the Spirit, there's no law against what you're doing. <clears throat> Continue with that one in verse 24. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, remember, we're no longer bound, we belong to Jesus now, been crucified with the flesh and its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. But now the last two bullets. I want to transition quickly to um, a moment of application here. <clears throat> Galatians five sixteen and 17. He says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you're not to do whatever you want. And then in Romans, he says a similar thing, where he says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by or set on the flesh is death, but the mind governed by or set on the Spirit is life and peace. See, here's the most incredible thing, and we're all aware of it. In this state of being already, not yet, I don't know if you've heard that phrase where we already have some of the future present. It's why the Holy Spirit's referred to by Paul three times as a deposit. It's because we only have the Spirit's power and presence, as it were, in part. This is why we see healing happen sometimes and not all the time. This is why we still suffer, even as others suffer and life isn't perfect all the time. The Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We taste the future in part that gives us hope that the future is real. That there is a day when Jesus is going to come back and He's going to make it all new. And there will not be any more sickness no more death, no more crying, no more tears. Creation, we're going to get new bodies. We, that's not just fanciful, what, what, uh, fiction stuff out there. I'm telling you guys, when I do funeral sermons, messages, this is the thing I want to help people understand, is that you know people are sitting out there and they hear you say, but your beloved one is with Jesus and you'll see them again. And over being a pastor for the last 30 plus years, I've heard people say, but how do you know, Mark? How do you really know that that's not just pie in the sky, wishful dreaming? Because of the Spirit. The Spirit is a deposit. The Spirit's testified with your heart. You have tasted some of the future in part that says, yes, I know the future's real. I know it's coming. I will see those who have died and have gone ahead of me. I will see them again. Just as Jesus in the transfiguration saw Moses and Elisha. Elijah. They were real. We're going to see them again, you guys. And we know that we know that we know. Because we have tasted of the future by the deposit of the Holy Spirit. And yet we suffer. And yet some of us get healed and some don't. John Wimber, the, the founder of the vineyard that I was a, a part of for so long, even then John would say, you know, guys, even if you get healed today, tomorrow you can get hit by a bus. <laughs> or you get healed today and tomorrow you get some other thing and die. Healing, he says, only postpones the inevitable. Until Jesus comes back and makes all things new, healing just postpones the inevitable. But you know what? We're not afraid of the inevitable. <laughs> we look forward to the inevitable. Right? Paul says, oh my gosh, what shall I choose? If I die, I get to go home. Woohoo! Oh, but if I stay, I get to hang out with you guys and do Jesus. Woo! So he says, I don't lose either way. It's win-win for me. I die, I go home here. I'm with you and Jesus. It's all good to me. That should be our attitude on the planet. And even such that Paulson can say that I even delight in weakness, hardship, in, in weakness, hardship, insult, persecution, and difficulties. I bet you don't have that one on your fridge. 
Oh, Lord, I can't wait to delight in weakness, hardship, insult, persecution, and difficulty today. Bring it on, Lord. No, but Paul could really say that because he genuinely recognized that it's when I'm weak, he says, then I experience the strength, the power and presence of Jesus when, in a way that I wouldn't have to otherwise. That's the crazy part about Christians. Why do they still smile when they suffer? Why do they have those moments of joy while they suffer? It's because of the deposit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It makes all the difference. Well, that was a total extra thing, sorry. <clears throat> Man, <laughs> now my head's got all kinds of other things I want to tell you. <laughs> but, but let me stop. <clears throat> Here's the point. What triggered that whole thing is when he says the flesh desires and the spirit desires. The point is we still inhabit these fallen, broken bodies. Romans 7 and 8, Paul is saying the critical thing, even kind of 6 through 8, is that even though we feel the flesh desires, he says we are no longer slaves to it. The most important thing about Christians is that we still have some of the same struggles and desires that the outsiders have, but we are not slaves to it any longer. We actually can have the power to say no to sexual temptation or whatever it is by the power of the Spirit. But the thing that I found so helpful was when he says, yeah, my flesh has desires, but the Holy Spirit has desires. You know what's really sad? Most people try to deal with those fleshly desires by going, oh God, I'm sorry I'm thinking this. I'm sorry I'm having this. Oh God, make it go away. Satan, I rebuke you. Oh God, You realize you're meditating on it? You know what you need to do more than anything else is the minute that temptation and that desire of your flesh comes, you come over here and go, Holy Spirit, what do you desire? What's on your heart? What's on your mind? What can we go do now? And then you go do something different. So many Christians try to fight the battle by focusing on the thing that you're trying to get freedom from and it makes you more enslaved to it. It's learning how to go, Holy Spirit, what do you desire? And here's the thing, is your, the last paragraph there is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I know, buddy. You hanging in there with me? Just a wee bit longer. <clears throat> the problem is, is after 48 years of being a Christian, there's a lot of stuff in me. <laughs> and while I start talking, my brain starts going all over the place, and I want to tell you everything that's in me. So it's a lot of work to rein it all in, just tell you this much. But here's the last part. So many times people will go, well, how do I know what the Spirit desires? How do I discern when the Spirit's actually talking to me? What does it mean to be led by, to follow, to walk? How do we do that? Well, here in this paragraph, what Paul finally says is this fascinating thing where he says, the only one who knows the thoughts of a person is the person. Part of my dissertation was a focus on neuroscience. And what's really fascinating about all the non-Christian neuroscience out there is that they can't figure out what part of the human body and the human brain keeps us from being like the animals. Meaning that when the brain is programmed, you have to do what the programming is in there. And yet, how is it that we can stand outside of the programming, look at the programming, even think about we want to change that programming, and it's called the human spirit. The human spirit actually is supposed to be that part of us that is empowered by the Holy Spirit that causes us to have the power to stop, the power to look at what's going on, the power to say, Holy Spirit, what do you desire? It's that part of us that gets empowered by the Holy Spirit that we can actually choose to think, choose to do something different. But here he says, the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God. And the amazing thing is that this Holy Spirit has been given to us and he communicates with us what's on the God's heart and mind. So for you and I, what I finally have learned over the years is that the way you learn to, to, to discern what the Spirit desires so that you can actually say, what do you want to do now, Holy Spirit? 
How are you leading? What does it mean to walk by? How are you teaching and training me? One of the ways, first of all, is learning how to discern the difference between your own thoughts and the thoughts of the Holy Spirit. Probably, I would have no way to corroborate this except for 48 years of being a Christian and a pastor and whatever for some of that. Most people discern the presence and voice of the Holy Spirit through your own thoughts. The hardest part is discerning what's the difference between yours and His. And you know what? The only way you get good at that, first of all, is you've got to practice and pay attention and step out in faith when you sense something else is there. Sometimes it'll come as a random thought that you weren't even thinking about anything and it shows up. Sometimes when I'm listening to things, something pops into my mind and I think it's the Lord. So many times when I'm praying for people, I just trust the next thing that comes into my mind. But it's practice. But it's believing that the Holy Spirit really is. His thoughts from the Father and the Son are also in the midst of yours. You're not going to necessarily hear a voice But you will grow to know the difference. But the other thing that has so helped me over all the years is the thing again, if you'll come to that weekend, is that for the last 30 years, passage after passage after passage, putting it in first person so that God is a person talking to me about himself and about his heart and about what he cares about. And as I've heard him say that over and over and over in first person, it's helped me to expect God to continue to speak first person. And I would trust the next first person thoughts that would come into my mind, and especially the thoughts that sound like all the written ones I've heard him say. Do you follow? Does that make sense? Right, so that when he says, Mark, I am, I am the Lord, the Lord, the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to you and to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. When I've heard him say that to me thousands of times, I know his heart. And when something pops into my mind that sounds like that, feels like that, reflects that, I'm generally certain that's probably the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? One of the things I I, I just try to just drop into people's hearts from time to time is try to begin even this little thing of stop using the phrase, well, the Bible says. Try to blow that up out of your vocabulary. Instead say, what the Lord says through Paul, what the Lord said through John, what the Lord says today through Peter, Because in 2 Peter 1, remember it says that everything that was written, people were carried along by the Holy Spirit and wrote what the Holy Spirit guided them to write. So it means the whole book is His. But what happens is that it causes you to start thinking about Scripture in terms of it's His and He wants to talk to you through it. Because when you put it in that third person, well, the Bible says it just becomes information. It's truthful information, but it doesn't cultivate the relationship necessarily. But boy, as you learn to hear, like yesterday I had a board meeting, we had an all-day board retreat for First Loved, and I just remember sitting there, and one of the things I said, I feel like the Lord wants to remind us again, through Paul in 2 Corinthians 9.8, I, your God, will bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need... You will abound in every good work through me. That puts faith in your heart. That puts faith in your heart. Or when the Lord says, I said, the very first day I stepped out in 2006 to start First Love Ministries, the very first weekend we ever did, it was a discipleship program in my church for probably close to nine years. It was a nine, ten-month discipleship program, and I had to go step out and do it on a weekend. And I remember the first time I went out to do that, a friend from my church walked up to me, handed me a three-by-five card and said, Mark, I feel like the Lord wants to say this to you through Isaiah. And I read it, and it was this, Isaiah 42, 16. Mind you, I am stepping out 
And the Lord says, Mark, I will lead you when you are blind by ways you have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide you. I will turn your darkness into light before you. I will make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do, and I will never forsake you. Do you realize what that did to my soul? The faith that it produced in my soul. Passage after passage, 30 years now, I have hundreds of them internalized. Why? Because they became messages of love to my heart from the Lord. Not just truthful information that I'm trying in my own strength to obey. It's learning how to discern and be empowered by and walk with the Holy Spirit. Where the book is still informing me of who He is and what He's like and what His ways are. But it's relational. It's not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as revealed to us through the Bible. Instead of the Bible says, say the Lord says, Papa says, Abba says, through this one, through that one, through this one. Learn to hear him through the text because then you'll become way more confident about what you're thinking when it lines up to all the things he's said to you before through the word that you know are true. Enough? Do you got enough to chew on today? Yea, God. Father, thank you. Mostly thank you for their patience and endurance with me, especially my buddy down here in the front row. And some others. Lord, I know you designed us to only listen to like 10 minutes before we lose interest. But I pray, Lord, that the things you put on my heart to share today, every minute of them, were important and relevant to my brothers and sisters in this part of my family, your family. Lord, I pray with all my heart that you continue to empower them as they're embarking and trying to make foundational in their lives to become more like you, to be Christ-like. Lord, I pray that they would really, really recognize your role, Holy Spirit, in this process. Lord, most of all, we just want to encounter you in such powerful, loving ways that would cause us to want to tell you, tell others about you. Till we see this thing overflowing, Lord, this room overflowing with bodies, two and three, four, five services, because people can't get enough of you. So to that end, Lord, we pray, be blessed and let these words bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.